Our gracious and loving Father, we were sinners. Uh, we were heading toward hell, and we were supposed to face eternal punishment for our sins. But because of your love and because of your grace, you saved us from eternal hell. And you made us your children so that we can join you in heavenly kingdom. And we know we'll be with you eternally. And Lord, you are blessing us so much in our life day by day. Especially, you gather us here again for the Bible study. So Lord, while we are studying Deuteronomy and Joshua today, help us to understand your will and encourage us and strengthen us so that we can live as a child in this world boldly, preaching the gospel, working for your glory until Jesus comes. Especially uh, this week, in many places, the Life Horse Seminar, the Bible Seminar is going on. So Lord, please be with them and give the, uh, the power to the speakers and uh, help the audience to listen carefully so that they can find the truth and peace from the Bible seminar, receiving salvation this time. So Lord, thank you so much for using our church for preaching the gospel all the time. And please help us to bear many fruits in coming days so that we can glorify you. Also, we are planning to have the Bible seminar, English Bible seminar in May. So Lord, we want to invite as many friends as possible this time. So give us chance and give us boldness to share the gospel with our friends so that uh, we can also invite many friends this time. So until we finish, I commit the rest of time unto your mighty hand. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Um, Deuteronomy. So we are in the last part of the Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 6, uh, 5 and 6. Deuteronomy chapter 34, la the last chapter, verses 5 and 6, two verses. If you have found it, let's read uh, verse 5 and 6 together. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. So this is the end of the Pentateuch, the five books by Moses. And we see Moses dying in this chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 34. So somebody asked, who wrote this uh, chapter 34? Because Moses died. And then who wrote? What happened after Moses died? Actually, we don't know. Maybe uh, it's possible that God already showed Moses what will happen after he dies. That's possible. Or maybe Joshua added some part at the end of the, this Deuteronomy. Either way, what we know is even this part is the word of God, so we have no problem. So finally, uh, Moses, the prophet, the prophet, the greatest prophet of Israel, died. Right? I think you know how many years he lived. 120 years, right? And we can divide his life into three parts. So first 40 years, he was the prince of Egypt, right? He was enjoying his life as a, as the, as a prince of Egypt. But the middle 40 years, he wanted, to, he wanted to live for God, but he needed some training. So God sent him to the Median the wilderness so that he can learn how to be humble, and how to be like a meek, you know, meek, very kind. Uh, so uh, basically he became like a sheep. He was tending the sheep as a shepherd for 40 years, and he became like a sheep uh, because uh, you know, God trained him. So last 40 years, last 40 years, he was the leader of the people of Israel, leading them through the wilderness. So now, this time, they are right before the land of Canaan, the promised land, and his job is finished. So he died here. Whenever I think about Moses, uh, it comforts me. Why? Because he needed 
40 year training to be used by God, right? Sometimes I feel like uh, I'm not really fit for God's ministry. I mean, everyone, we think that uh, we are lacking something before God. But Moses, the greatest leader, he needed how many years for training? 40 years. 40 year training, right? It's a long time, actually. So when we see God training Moses for 40 years for his uh, ministry, uh, you know, we haven't, I think uh, nobody here, uh, uh, you know, you haven't been, it, it hasn't been even 40 years after you got saved, right? So anyway, God is training us every day. Uh, what we should do is we should be just faithful in our position so that we can just follow God until the end. Then God will use us like Moses, uh, God used Moses. But here, just one thing you have to remember. After Moses died, nobody, nobody knew where he was buried. Basically, God hid his dead body corpse. Anyone knows why? I think you know what? You don't know? <laughs> Okay, it's good. That's why we are doing this Bible study. You, you learn many things, right? Uh, that's good. <laughs> I was kind of shocked, actually. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Satan always tried to somehow use whatever he has to get this uh, attention from the people. So what I'm saying is, suppose there's a dead body of Moses. Then Satan will use the dead body of Moses so that the people of Israel would worship him, actually, the dead body. Because of Moses, who is Moses? You know, Moses, how many miracles he performed, right? Ten plagues in Egypt before they came out of Egypt. And then even in the wilderness, uh, you know, the, the water and uh, the crossing the Red Sea and all kinds of miracles he performed. So... Somehow, Israel people, they, they kind of respected Moses. And then Satan could use that, the dead body and say to the people, worship this, the dead body of Moses, uh, like a, you know, raising him very high at the level of God, actually, right? So because God knew already that Satan might use his body uh, in such a way that God hid it. So let's bookmark here. We'll come back here and let's go to Jude. Jude chapter 1 verse 9, and uh, maybe you don't know where Jude is because it's just one chapter, very short uh, epistle, so it's right before Revelation. So second last book in the New Testament, second last book. So Revelation is the last one, and right before that, there's a Jude, verse 9. Verse 9, uh, Jude, by the way, you know that this Jude is um, Jesus half-brother, right? James and Jude, the, these two epistles were written by Jesus' half-brothers. Uh, so this Jude, uh, he was also the son of Mary, the Jesus' mother, right? So Jude, chapter 1, only one chapter. Verse 9, let's read it together. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Okay, here, here, verse 9, we can find out some facts, some interesting facts. First of all, Michael the archangel. There are some angels who has a name actually, right? I think you, have, you know one more. The one who is always bringing the good news. Who is it? Gabriel. Okay. This Michael is like, a, he is the general, like a, you know, the army general. He is the one who is always fighting for Israel, something like that. So here, Michael was contending. Contending means arguing. Arguing with the devil, Satan. Regarding what? Regarding the body of Moses. So, uh, even though it was not written in the Deuteronomy, what happened in the spiritual realm, not in the physical realm? Nobody knew what was going on, but Jude, he got this uh, revelation from God, so he wrote this. So what happened was the devil, Satan, and Michael 
was fighting over the dead body of Moses. And of course, uh, God hid the dead body so that Satan cannot use it. However, here, something interesting. Uh, Michael dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So basically, the devil, Satan, the Lucifer, and Michael are at the same level, I guess. It's not like uh, Michael is higher than, higher than this uh, devil, because if Michael was uh, much higher than this uh, devil, he could rebuke him, and then he could kind of that, uh, you know, uh, somehow defeat defeat this uh, devil. But he couldn't do that here. Just Michael said, the Lord rebuke you. God will rebuke you. Let's see. Because um, they are almost have the same power actually. Okay. So uh, in this spiritual realm, spiritual sphere, there's a battle going on. So we see what happened when Moses died. When Moses died, uh, the devil and Michael, the archangel, were fighting over the dead body of Moses. But God hid the body so that uh, people could not worship the dead body of Moses. Okay? And let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 33, actually. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 29, the last verse of uh, chapter 33 because this is the last word. I think we read this one before, but anyway, I want to read it again because uh, this is such an uh, in, uh, encouraging verse. So Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 29. Let's read it together. Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. Your enemies shall submit to you and you shall tread down their high places. Let's remember, this is the last word of Moses, because after this, he died, right? So here, we see three things. You should see three things. Number one, salvation. Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. God saved you, salvation. And secondly, protection, protection of God, because uh, the shield of your health. God is the shield, shield, protection, right? Shield and the sword of your majesty. God is your shield and sword. God protects you. And third, victory. Because um, your enemies shall submit to you and you shall tread down their high places. Eventually, Israel, you will have a victory over your enemy. So your enemy will submit to you. So you see three things here. Salvation, protection, and victory. And this is exactly what will happen to us Christians, right? We have received salvation from God, right? Salvation. And God is protecting us now. Actually, God is protecting us, leading us. And then third, thirdly, there will be victory. Actually, once we believed in Jesus Christ, we already have victory. Because you remember when Jesus died on the cross, he crushed the head of the serpent, right? He crushed the head of the Satan. Satan uh, hurt the heel of Jesus because uh, Jesus died on the cross. But with the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus crushed uh, the head of Satan. So the final victory is ours, actually, right? We are, okay, what we are doing now is, even though the final victory is with Jesus, still uh, the war hasn't ended yet. So the local small, small wars are going on, okay? So sometimes we, you know, we lose, you know, we get tempted and we make mistakes. But let's remember the final victory is with our Lord Jesus. And we are with Jesus, so we will be the victors, right? We are the victors, actually. Once we believe in Jesus, we are the victors. So, happy are you, O Israel. So not only Israel, but also we are happy. And this is a very important question to you. Are you happy? <laughs> Brother, the youth are always happy. <laughs> <laughs> you should be happy if you really believe this one, right? Now, when you imagine 
what heaven is like, what kind of the eternal kingdom God prepared for us. And when you go there and when I go there, there will be no death, no pain, no sickness, right? No, no sinful nature anymore. Um, all the blessings will be there. So salvation, protection, victory. Happy are you, O Israel. And finally, uh, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10. Verse 10. Uh, 2 12, the last part of Deuteronomy. Let's read together. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10 to 12. Let's read it together. But since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and in all his land. And by all that mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. There's no other prophet like Moses after him. Until Jesus, actually. Until Jesus. So, Moses was the greatest prophet of Israel in the Old Testament. And then God promised Israel, I will raise up a prophet like Moses in the future. Listen to him. And that prophet is whom? Jesus Christ, right? So until Jesus came into this world, there was no prophet like Moses. And Moses and Jesus, they are very similar actually because Moses saved the people of Israel from the bondage as a slaves. But Jesus saved us from eternal hell, right? And Moses was very kind and meek. You have to know the word meek, M-E-E-K, meek. Very, um, uh, not smooth, but uh, anyway, gentle, uh, like that, right? So Jesus was also very gentle, kind, right? So, um, and Moses performed many miracles. Jesus performed many miracles. Anyway, two are very similar. So we know that uh, God already promised to send Jesus uh, to Israel. So we finish Deuteronomy. But let me just read from our textbook because this will be on the quiz, okay? <laughs> so Deuteronomy chapter 34 According to Deuteronomy chapter 34, after the song of final words of blessing, Moses went up to the top of Mount Nebo, and there God showed him the promised land toward which his face had so long been set. So Moses really longed to enter the land, but God said no. We know that he died there and that the Lord buried him. No one knows where, someone once said, God buried his burial. Okay, anyway, God buries the workmen, but carries on the work. Why do you think Moses' grave was hidden? No doubt it would have become the object of superstitious idolatry, like, uh, you know, the object of worship of Israel. That's why. So whether Moses himself wrote Deuteronomy chapter 34 by revelation, or whether Joshua edited it later is Immaterial. Immaterial means it's not important. The herd of the slaves made into a nation by Moses. So Israel was a slaves, just a bunch of slaves before. But, you know, with the leadership of Moses for 40 years, they have become a great army now, right? So the herd of slaves, a group of slaves made into a nation by Moses, wept for him 30 days. Had it not been for their perversity, they might still have had him with them. What this means is, actually Moses could not enter the land of Canaan because he made a mistake when he was, uh, he, he, he beat the rock twice when he uh, had the water out of the rock. And that mistake was caused by the, uh, the stubbornness of the people of Israel. So if the Israel people were obedient, then um, Moses would not have made such a mistake, and then Moses would have gone with them together to the land of Canaan. But you know, it, it didn't happen. So we read of Moses again in the Gospels. One day, Jesus took Peter, James, John, 
and climbed up Mount Hormon. Actually, this might not be the Mount Hormon. We don't know exactly which, which mount, but uh, to the north of the Sea of Galilee. Then Moses and Eliza appeared and talked with Jesus about his coming death. We call this transfiguration. Transfiguration means Jesus changed it. He became like a light. Very, I mean, he was shining, basically, right? Let's turn to Matthew, uh, chapter 17, verse 1 to 3. Matthew, chapter 17, verse 1 to 3. Matthew, chapter 17, verse 1 to 3. Let's read it together. Now, after six days... Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Eliza appeared to them, talking with him. So you know, this transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain. By the way, the name of the mountain is not here. But uh, you know, he, the author just guessed it's the mountain hormone. Um, one thing I'd like to share regarding this one. You see the word transfigure in verse 2? And he was a transfigured. Do you see the word transfigure in verse 2? Okay. When you study the Bible, you have to know and memorize this kind of word. Okay, Jesus changing on this mountain is called transfiguration. Okay, transfiguration. The reason why we're having this uh, English Bible study is not just, uh, you know, not just to improve your English, but also you should make yourself familiar with uh, the words in the Bible. If not, when you talk with an unbeliever or someone else, you might not be able to use this uh, exact word, and then you might say something else. It's not really good, actually. You should know and use this word, transfiguration. That is, uh, we call it like a theological terms, theological word, okay? So transfiguration means Jesus' body has changed. He, he became like the light, the bright light, on the top of the mountain when he took uh, Peter, John, and James. Peter, James, and John, three disciples. This is called transfiguration. And actually this mountain, we don't know the exact uh, name of the mountain. People just call it the Mount of Transfiguration. Byonhwasan. <laughs> In Korean language. The Mount of Transfiguration. So, when you study the Bible, know the word, the exact word, so that when you talk with someone else, you can say something. By the way, why Moses and Eliza? Moses and Eliza, why? When Jesus, when Jesus, I mean, not only Jesus, in the time of Jesus, when people talk about the Bible, when they refer to the Bible, they said, the law and the prophets. Do you remember? Jesus said, uh, like, a, like a, didn't you hear haven't you read it in the law and the prophets? And when Jesus said, when Jesus mentioned the law and the prophets, that, that refers to the Old Testament Bible. Do you understand? Okay. And then Moses represents the law. He was the one who received the law. Elijah represents the prophets because he was the main prophet in the uh, Old Testament. So when Jesus said the law and the prophets, that is the same as Moses and Eliza. Okay? So, what was happening here on this Mount of Transfiguration? Why Jesus was talking with uh, Moses and Eliza? What they were talking about his death and uh, uh, resurrection, right? So what happened was, his death and his resurrection was already mentioned in the Old Testament, right? Old Testament. So Jesus was just uh, talking with them regarding his death and resurrection from the Old Testament. So anyway, let's remember Moses represents the law. 
Elijah represents the prophets, and Moses and Elijah means that the Old Testament. Okay, so here Moses, Moses died, but he is alive because he is with God now, and that is the end of uh, Deuteronomy. And then uh, let's go to Joshua. Okay. So I'm very happy to start the new book from today, Joshua. We are going slow, slow, slowly because uh, I want you to have time to read it by yourself and you have to study it, okay? So before we go to the Joshua, now we are entering another group of the Bible books in the Old Testament. The first group in the Old Testament, the five books were called Pentateuch, written by Moses. And then the second part is called the history. Of course, I would say Moses' book is also history. But because Moses wrote, we just call it Pentateuch. Okay? So we have 12 more books for history. And Joshua is the first book in this second group of the books in the uh, Old Testament. So there are, uh, other than this Pentateuch, there are 12 books of history. So let's read uh, these, uh, the names of these 12 books. Uh, Joshua, Judges, let's read it together. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. By the way, in the original Hebrew Bible, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel was one book. 1 Kings and 2 Kings was one book. So 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles was one book. So still, even now, in the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew Bible, the Bible the Jewish people are reading, they are one book, not two books. It's okay, the same. Just uh, when the English version came out, they divided it because it was too long. And not only that, the 12 minor prophet books, starting with Hosea, Hosea to Malachi, it, was one, it is one book in Jewish Bible. That's why the number of books are different between the uh, English version, not only English, our Bible too, right? The Protestant Church Bible, Old Testament, and the Jewish Old Testament Bible. The number of books are different, but exactly the same, because uh, just, uh, you know, some, some books were divided, okay? So, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. These are the 12 history books. And then here, actually, um, uh, we see the key events of the books of history. So there are four pictures here which shows the four key events described in these uh, history books. Number one, this shows, you see the, the, these are the high priest carrying the Ark of Covenant. And you see this water, this is the River Jordan. So uh, in the book of Joshua, what you see is when this high priest stepped into the water of the Jordan River, the river stopped so that they could cross the Jordan River. So this number, first picture shows that entering the promised land, entering the promised land that is written in Joshua. And after that, later, later, of course, uh, there were judges, but after the judges, the kingdom started, kingdom. And this second picture shows that the glorious times of the Israel, two kings. The first king is King Saul, but uh, after him, King David and King Solomon. These two kings, the time Israel was the strongest. Okay? the most glorious. And they were so strong, they reigned over many, many nations, right? So this is the second part, of uh, second key event in the history books. And then the third one, 
This is uh, Assyrians. Assyrians conquered Israel. Okay. Israel was divided into two nations after the death of King Solomon. Why? Because of the sin of King Solomon. King Solomon worshipped the idols. Why? Because he married the Gentile women. So the, his wives, his wives were, they tempted him to worship the idols. So because of the sin of King Solomon, the kingdom has been divided, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. So the, the um, Israel in the north, northern Israel, was destroyed by Assyrians in 722 BC. Let's remember 722 BC. Okay? And then later, Judah in the south also was conquered by the Babylonians, Babylonians in 606 BC. 606 BC. So you remember these two uh, events. That, that is all, actually, the key events in the uh, history books. Okay? So let's start with Joshua. By the way, in the, in the, on the top, I put it, Joshua means Yahweh. Yahweh, means, well, Yahweh is the name of uh, God, Jehovah. Okay? Uh, Jehovah saves, or Yahweh, or Jehovah is salvation. And I think you know that the name Jesus and Joshua are the same name. Joshua is the same name as Jesus. Because Jesus means, you know, he will save his own people from uh, their sins, right? Jesus, basically, the name Jesus means salvation. Joshua also, salvation of God. Like a Yah Yahweh is salvation, okay? So Joshua, here. Joshua portrays Jesus Christ, captain of our salvation. Let's think about this one. What did Joshua do? He took the people of Israel into the, to the land of uh, Canaan, right? The promised land. The promised land, when they entered the promised land, finally, they had the rest, peace, right? So what did Jesus do? Jesus saved us sinners and brought us to the eternal rest, eternal kingdom of God, right? So in that same sense, uh, we see the ministry of Joshua somehow is a type of the ministry of Jesus Christ later. So Joshua, uh, his name means Yahweh, Jehovah saves, and Jehovah is salvation, uh, which is the same as um, Jesus. So the author is Joshua, even though, you know, Always, uh, some, uh, someone says it's not, but it is Joshua. That's what the Bible says. And the date, always, uh, I think this uh, book, uh, this is book, uh, some of uh, uh, not quite correct, because uh, uh, the book was, of Joshua was written around, actually, after 1,399 B.C., because... Uh, we know the beginning of the conquest. The beginning of conquest means the year, the year when um, the Israel started, like across the uh, Jordan River and entered the land of Canaan was 1,406 B.C. We know that exact year from the Bible. And that's why, and then it took seven years for them to conquer most of the land. So the land was probably occupied about 1,399 B.C. It took seven years. And then after this one, of course, after this one, Joshua wrote it, but before he died. So it is around the time, not uh, here, as uh, the author says, uh, between 1,200, 1,170 B.C. Actually, this uh, discrepancy always happens because the history of Egypt is not correct. The history of Egypt is known to be very inaccurate. That's why... There are two different groups of scholars regarding the history of Egypt. That's why there's a confusion. But for us, this is uh, not this date, but uh, this is uh, more correct. So let's just remember uh, the beginning of the conquest was 1406 BC, and the land was uh, occupied around 1399 BC. Okay, and then 
This book serves as the link between the Pentateuch and the later historical books. Uh, this is in the middle, actually, um, because uh, Pentateuch is the book of Moses, and then later the kingdom starts, so it's in the middle. Its name is derived from the uh, principal character, Joshua. So chapters, there are 24 chapters, by the way. So chapters 1 to 24, 22, the first 22 chapters describe the conquest of the land and its division among the tribes of Israel. Okay, so let's see the big picture. There are 24 chapters, but uh, up to 22, chapter 22, it is the conquest, how, how they conquered the land of Canaan and how they divided the land among the 12 tribes. That is up to chapter 22. And there are two more chapters, final chapters. In the final chapters, uh, chapter 23 and 24, Joshua exhorts the people in a series of farewell addresses uh, to be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Always, you know, always before Moses died, before Joshua died, they always says, keep, obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Obey the word of God, right? Let's turn to Joshua, chapter 23, verse 6. <coughs> Joshua, chapter 23, verse 6. Uh, Joshua chapter 23, verse 6. Let's read it together. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. You see here, keep and do, keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Why? This is our duty. Right? This is our duty as his children. Not only children of Israel, but also we who are God's child. Our duty is to obey and keep the commandment of uh, God. Actually, So here, I, I just put this question. What will we say or regret when we die? So suppose you are dying right now. I think uh, when I'm dying, I will regret that I didn't really obey the word of God fully. Okay? Why, I, uh, why I didn't do my best? Because it's like this. When you die, nothing matters. Your house doesn't matter. Your job doesn't matter. Right? Now you're going back to God. And when you stand before God, the only thing God will see in your life is right? how, much, how much you obeyed. The word of God. How much you love God. Right? Nothing else. Not your position, not your job, how many children you have, or how smart you were, or how rich you were, or where you're from. You're Korean, or you're from Cameroon, or it doesn't matter, basically. Okay? Nothing matters, but how much you obey the word of God. That's why before Moses died, before Joshua died, they always say, keep, do and keep the word of God as much as possible. So that's what uh, Joshua said uh, as his farewell, the last speech. Okay, and let's go to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, we start uh, uh, Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Let's read it together. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all he, these people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. After the death of Moses, you know that the death of Moses is dead, but God's ministry continues. God's ministry goes on. This is what happens even in the church. Okay, sometimes we follow some leader, but after he dies, you know, God will, 
God will appoint another leader, another servant. So his ministry continues, actually, right? And in this ch first chapter, in this first chapter, uh, there's uh, one lesson we have to learn. Um, whenever I read this first chapter, I find that some word of God is being repeated. Uh, verse 6, verse 6, I will show you. Verse 6, be strong and of good courage. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. And verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. And verse 18, the last verse, whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words, in all that you command him, shall be put to death. The last part, let's read it together. Only be strong and of good courage. How many times? Four times, right? Be strong and of good courage. Be strong, be strong. Why God keeps saying be strong? Because I believe that Joshua was kind of the afraid. Why? Because Moses is gone, right? Moses used to be the great leader, great prophet, and now Joshua should lead how many people? We know that 2 million or even 3 million, depending on, we just guess, but usually 2 million. Suppose, just think, you have to lead 2 million people. The lives of the 2 million people is in your hands, and uh, you have to take care of them, you have to, and, and you have to enter the promised land, but who is living in the promised land? The giant, the giant, right? And then, their cities and their, their fort, the fortress is so strong, right? That's why, Cades Barnea, you remember? When the 12, 12 spies were sent from the Cades Barnea, they came back and then 10 of them said, no way, we are like a grasshoppers before their eyes, so we cannot enter the land of Canaan, right? The situation is the same. The giants are still living there. That's why God keeps saying to Joshua, be strong and be of good courage. And let's remember, we have to be strong also. No. I don't know why the Christians are discouraged and sometimes Christians are very down. Because, because of this one, verse 5. This, the promise of God is there for Joshua. Verse 5. Verse 5. Let's read it together. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses. So I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. This is the very reason why we should be strong and we should be courageous, right? Right? God said, I will never and ever leave you nor forsake you. And it, actually, for us Christians, it's better, much better than Joshua, because we know that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in our heart. He's, he never leaves us. So wherever we go, we are with whom? The Holy Spirit. Right. The Holy Spirit is with us all the time, 24 hours, seven days a week, right? He never and ever leaves us. So there's a reason for to be strong and of courage. Not only Joshua, but also us. But uh, I think uh, when Joshua kept hearing this encouragement from God, he became very strong. And number two, uh, one more, one more, one more lesson we have to learn from Joshua is in verse 8. Verse 8. Verse 8. Let's read it together. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Everyone wants to be successful in their life, right? So here, actually what happened was Joshua, he had to fight against these people in the land of Canaan. And God never said, okay, you're about to fight, so let's do the, some training of the soldiers, eh? how to fight, how to make a, you know, how to, how to march, how to fight. God never said like that. God said, read the Bible, observe it, meditate on it, then you'll be success. 
Okay, suppose one brother comes to me, Pastor, I just got a new job. What can I do? What should I say? Read the Bible, meditate on it, okay? One, one sister comes and says, Pastor, my children, they do not listen to me. Uh, what, how can I educate them? So what can I say? Read the Bible, meditate on it, observe it, okay? Because you, you see this one? Joshua was about to fight, actually, but God never mentioned about the battle or how to fight well. But God just said, you shall meditate in it day and night, day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then, then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So let me tell you, in your job, in your study, or in your family life, or whatever you do, the way to success is only one, right? Read the Bible, meditate on it, and observe it. That's what we have to learn from the first chapter of Joshua, because uh, even though Joshua now, he became the leader, great responsibility, and then he should fight against this giant, but still, it's the same. Exactly the same as like our Christian life, right? The Bible, this Bible, shows the way. So we have to read it, meditate on it, and observe it. That is the way to success. And how many times we just forget about it and then we just, we don't read the Bible, we just keep worrying. And do you know that Jesus said, do not worry many times? Do not worry. Jesus said, it's what the heathen, heathen means the unbelievers. It's what the unbelievers do. You have your heavenly father, don't worry. You see sometimes uh, they have the t-shirts, the smiley face and say, don't worry. Be happy, right? I think that's for Christians, actually, okay? Not the other people. Because we are the one who shouldn't worry and we should be happy because God is with us, right? So, anyway, um, we'll continue from this part. So, this uh, book of Joshua, I like it because, uh, actually, if you go to the book of Judges, it's very sad. You know, people keep, keep, making mistakes again and again, and they are failing again and again. But this book is different. The Joshua is the book of victory. Victory, right? So this is one of the uh, book we can see how we can be victorious in our Christian life. And there are many lessons we can learn. Because the, you saw the picture. The high priest just entered, just stepped into the, the river Jordan. When it was still flowing, it was the faith, faith. Faith will make you successful. Okay, so we'll we'll learn more from the book of Joshua next time. Let's pray together. Our heavenly Father, we are studying your word because we want to be encouraged, and we want to find out the way to success. And today we learned that when Joshua became the leader after Moses, you encouraged him so much, and. That was, this was the commandment of God for Joshua, read the Bible and meditate on it and observe the commandment in the Bible. So Lord, we, we are learning that the Bible, the word of God, is, the, is such, a, such an encouragement for us. And we can find all the wisdom and strength in the book of, in the, in the Bible. So Lord, thank you so much for giving us the Bible and we are studying one, by, uh, one book by one in this Tuesday English Bible study and fellowship. So Lord, help us uh, not only just uh, learn what is in the Bible, but also help us to practice it in our life so that we can grow, uh, we can be strengthened in our Christian life. And Lord, we have to fight the spiritual battle in our Christian life because the devil is still like a roaring lion and he, the devil is trying to devour us and the uh, devil is trying to make us useless and powerless. But Lord, please give us strength and power so that we can continue to march as your soldiers to conquer the land uh, in our spiritual battlefield. So Lord, please encourage us and strengthen us. And we'll have the fellowship together after this. Be with us so that we can have the fruitful fellowship together. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.